and applications to Gaussian processes. Uh, please. Uh, okay, thanks. And uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for such a great summer school. And so my time to continue to build the part and applications to Gaussian process. You'll find it's different from the one in the booklet and in the upcoming first day because I changed it because I realized this is a summer school for probability. So we do need something on probability. So let's break up from the motivation and we look at the I think for ordinary differential equation, <coughs> it's a very common from control theory. So dy t equals f y t dx t. Uh, we want to we want to look at the ODE while x t the driving noise x t is very rough. But to get some ideas, let's first assume x has boundary variation and the vector field f is sufficiently regular. So there will always no question about the existence and uniqueness of the solutions. So so given a perfect so given a part x t one has a solution y t and when we ask what is the most essential property of the part x that produced the solution y given to vector field f. So it turns out that it's a sequence of iterative tensor integrals around x. What do you mean by tensor? Uh, okay, so can you just erase this box? Yeah, erase what? These crosses. Oh. Okay, so just the usual multiple integral, no? Uh yeah. Yes, uh, because x is vector values, and actually it is in two dimensions, say x1, x2, and dx1 tends dx tends to dx. It's just a collection of dx i, dx j, okay. and i j runs from one to two. So. And for every k, we do a k situated tensor integral on a part because x has boundary variation, so the definition is really well defined. And the collection of sequence contenders, <coughs> SFT, where we collect all iterated tensor integrals <coughs> together, and this object characterizes the most essential property of the path that determines the outcome y. So we can define a norm, a p-variation norm on every x k as the following. And we define the p-variation norm over the interval S and T for the whole object X as the maximum of the first P object. And the P the P variation metric between these two collections of iterative tensor integrals is what is known. So the important thing about this metric is that so you are given a part x, which is an input, you get an output y, this is a solution map. And actually this solution map is locally Lipschitz with respect to this p-variation norm. It's proved by Terry Lawrence in 1998. So with this property, when the driving noise x is highly irregular, we can still retain this property so that we can have some results about the solution y. So. The most important thing about this collection X is that it's multiplicative. It's first proved by KT Chen in 1950. <laughs> Actually, this identity holds for every part of boundary variation. So if you combine two adjacent intervals together, then the outcome of the whole interval is the tensor product of the two. And we call these things multiplicative functional this specific function's identity. So, and this introduces the definition of rough part. A pure rough part is just a, a multiplicative functional in the first tensor spaces, in the first p tensor spaces, we find a p variation controlled by omega in the following sense. So omega is a control, but you can just think of it as, and omega in general is a control function, but you can just think it out of as a c minus s. But so. Yes. 
that is that zero part. So the actual question about this is that if you are given a zero part, can you extend it to higher degrees? And if so, is the extension unique? It's just proved by Taiwan, although in 1998, saying that there does exist a unique extension for any p of parts, as long as it has p finite p variation controlled, a controlled finite p variation. And here, the constant ck only depends on k, and it's independent of s and t. It's uniform over all times. This is the extension theorem. And the continuity theorem says that if there are two p of parts, which are close for the p first levels, for the first p levels, then actually all of them are close in all higher levels with the same country. So this is in a deterministic setting, and we want to apply this theorem in probabilistic problems. Well, the most prominent examples is that X and Y are Gaussian process. But so, but for the proof of the deterministic theorem, when really depends on that the exponent has the form k over p, because you remember that uh, on the assumption we assume the condition is satisfied for all k from 1 to p, the integral part of p, and when you do induction, you really need to uh, use the positive code for the first k level, and you, and you look at the next level, the exponent is expected to be in this number, which is larger than one, so that you can use the other trick of dropping points. But usually when x and y are Gaussian process, <coughs> this condition is usually not satisfied. Instead, we will have k minus one over p on the exponent, so that when you drop points, the sum will not converge. And but this is just a technical point, and we have found some way to deal with it. And the idea is just to write epsilon into two parts, and you move part of the epsilon into the country to fill in the gap in the exponent so that it, so that it becomes larger than one. It's just like that you, you take some money from the rich people and give them to the poor, so that you in this way, and, and with this idea, we are able to prove the more general continuity theorem. Yeah. So, both are p rough part with finite p variation controlled by some omega, but now the continuity assumption is a little bit weakened with k minus delta over p on the exponent. If delta is, is, is more, then there is no essential difference. But if delta is large, then actually you see from the previous idea that we have a large in the rate of epsilon. But on the borderline case where delta equals 1 minus p, we, we get a logarithmic correction, but we can return the rate in the major case. Only get a logarithmic correction. So, now, uh, all of these are in deterministic setting, and we have switched to Gaussian processes. The idea is to look at Gaussian processes as to, to look at the sample part of Gaussian process as a drop part. So, first, we need some measurement of the regularity of the sample part. And it's the most convenient, it turned out to be most convenient to measure it via the covariance function as a two-dimensional rule, rule variation. So we take the definition from three standard trial in 2010. We assume x is the RG-valued central Gaussian process with independent components. And the covariance function is k. And the rule variation on the covariance function is defined by the following way. So it's actually a two-dimensional setting. This is a little bit different from the, say, if rho equals 1 and kx1 is finite, then we say the covariance has finite <coughs> one variation. But it's 
it's a little bit different from the usual boundary evaluation function. Because you see, uh, for the usual boundary evaluation function, you need to, the first order derivative is the finite measure. Uh, but for the two dimensional thing, you usually have dx, dy, and k to be a finite measure. So. This is just a little bit different, but anyway, here are some examples. So, for the fraction Brownian motion, the co-variation has one and root variation for root equals to one over two h if h is less than or equal to one half. So, if h is bigger than one half, it's just a one one variation of the covariance. The covariance uh, will immediately give the sample part regularity. So, if it has one and root variation. So the covariance of finite root variation will immediately imply sample part of hope is 1 over 2 root holder. A little bit less, though. So. By the way, what is yeah. H? H is the first parameter of fractional ground motion. So <laughs> if H equals one half, it's just ground motion. And in general, you define the. Yes. So if X is a fractional ground motion, say we have program F and T equals. Uh, or I actually forgot what this is. But yeah, I actually forgot. Let me see. It what? T to the 1 over 2 H. Right. I see one of Plus F. Oh. Plus, oh, no, no, no. I think I see minus F 1 over 2 H. And there are two other terms. But T and S. T and F. But anyway. So if H equals 1 half, then it's just running motion. Uh, but we can check what we can do later. <laughs> so. Is that correct? It should be. No, no, there are other terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there are other two terms. So, right. And, yes. So why you prove that the uh, further regularity? Can you use uh, uh, some kind of law we try to ignore that? It's a common law, right. Common law criteria. criteria. Oh, I mean, <coughs> and you want to show that the thing is very sharp. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, you have final regularity, it really only matters only if S and T are very close. Well, what I'm saying is that if uh, this is for guaranteed if you use a common law criteria. Uh, to get this higher than equality, yeah. you use a criminal criteria, right? Yeah, right. But there is another question that uh, if something is above that, uh, that one, then it doesn't work. There is another part of <coughs> The central person cannot uh, have order bigger than that. Uh, That's another kind of question. Oh, right. Isn't it? Yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, yes. And so remember we talked about the iterative part integrals before in the setting of bounding variation part. So but for a Poisson process, usually the part the sample parts are highly irregular. And so we say if X is a sample Gaussian process with independent components and has covariance of on and cheap root variation for some root less than two, strictly less than two. Then for any p bigger than two rule, x has a canonical lift to the almost sure it has a canonical lift to the space of p variation of part. And in particular, the, <coughs> the fifth order is just the difference as a position. So the idea is that when x has boundary variation, then the first order term then the first order process x actually gives all the higher level things. But when x is irregular, you do need some more information to characterize these things. 
and the more irregular axis, the more iterated integrals you need. So, but, so, but in general, if x is a Gaussian process, you need much less information, and you only need, um, it has a canonical lift. And so, but because due to a Gaussian process for h less than or equal to one half, it doesn't have it's not holder when half regular, so usually the canonic the the lift itself is not unique because uh, you remember previous device extension theorem that the first two levels will determine all the high levels, but if you are given less information, you can still extend, but the extension is in general not unique. But here for Gaussian process we do have a canonical lift in the sense that for any reasonable smooth or piecewise linear approximation the k to the integrals is the limit of these smooth approximations. And for Brownian motion, it coincides with the Stratonovich integral at the second level. And for the next, we want to study these different approximations. So we want to compare two Gaussian processes. We say x1 and y are joint Gaussian process, and they have independent components. While well, x and y both have finite root variation, and x minus y has finite root prime variation. Here, we want to think of y as some kind of approximation to x. So for the canonical list, for the first two levels, we have this estimate. this to hold for any gamma that is why gamma larger than or equal to root and 1 over gamma plus 1 over root is larger than 1. So by the extension and continuity theorem before, we actually can extend it to any higher level. This says that if you have two Gaussian process and you know their covariance and you also know that the covariance of their difference, then you can actually compare these two as rough paths to arbitrary higher levels. The reason for doing this is that we remember the solution map previously is local ellipses with respect to rough path metric. And as you take P to be large enough, usually you will get better and better convergence rates in that sense. So we can apply this to the solution of the differential equation. We assume V to be a smooth vector field, but this is a strong assumption, but if we assume V is smooth, then actually the mouse that you throw out will then depend on the actual vector field you choose, and it doesn't depend on the starting point. It's uniform for all things. So if you let STN to be the piecewise linear approximation to the Gaussian process X with mesh size 1 over N, then the solution will converge arbitrarily close to the rate of 1 over N to be 3 over 2 root minus 1. So for Brownian motion root equals 1 then it says the, the convergence rate is almost 1 half. It's just a little bit less than 1 half, but almost. You can arbitrarily close to it. The convergence is uniformly almost surely. And this also includes the Gaussian process we find a rule range for arbitrary rule less than 3 over 2. <coughs> Actually, free time rival got another rate is 1 over rule minus 1 half. So in general, it is better for rule bigger than 1, but for rule equals to 1, these two coincide, and both give the sharp rate for almost 1 half. But for rule bigger than 1, yes? Yeah. May I ask that uh, what is the smoothness requirement in order to get this? Oh, we assume V is smooth, uh, the infinite value. So infinitely differentiable. Uh -huh. And what if not? Do you get the result? Uh, you, uh, you, uh, usually for Brownian motion, you need 2 plus epsilon. Sorry? Usually for Brownian motion, and you usually need C about should plus that long, but, but this is in general a Gaussian process, which we only know 
the covalence regularity. And on the other hand, so the smoothness assumption is that if you assume V is smooth, then actually the knots that you throw away doesn't depend on the actual vector field V, and it doesn't depend on the initial starting point. So in general, yeah, fine. But, but I think, yeah, is it possible to weaken the assumption on the smoothness? But I'm not sure. So to the free time where I don't get another kind of inference. So for the larger than one, it is a little bit better than the previous one here, than the one we got here. So the reason is, remember, we got our higher level estimate merely based on the first two levels by using the extension and continuity theorem. But, in, but this is because that the exponent drops below one, so that we, we have lost something in the weight epsilon to fill in the gap in the control to get the continuity for higher levels. And, but they know that this is a Galkin curve, therefore they can estimate the third le level by hand so that they, they will no longer need to sacrifice anything. But really, this estimate takes about 10 pages to prove singly. So, but for root equals one, which includes Brownian motion and the Wollenberg process, these two rates coincide, and they are both sharp. And another application of this rough part can is inspired by Martin Heyer in 2001 on his paper on rough stochastic PDEs. He, he considers Gaussian rough parts as a passing space. So, let's, so if we look at the following stochastic Berger's like equation, where it's nonlinear and the nonlinear term is G and cosine is a space time wide noise. So if G is some grid is a gradient of some function, then we can define the weak solution in the following sense. But if G is not a gradient of any function, then the situation becomes a little a little bit more involved. And we do need a motion of this integral, say how to define this integral. So highest idea is that for any fixed t, the solution u is a rough path in x. Here he views x as a time for any fixed t. And, thi and this integral can be defined in the rough path sense. And he can prove uniqueness, existence and uniqueness of weak solutions. What if you just subtract from u this t? I'm sorry? What if you subtract from u yes. this c depending on time? Because space time might be. Oh, space time. Oh, I see. Space time. Okay. Ah. So, yeah, let's look at an, an example when g equals 0. But <coughs> It's the stochastic heat equation. In 2001, last year, Mark, Martin Heyer shows that for any fixed time t, the stationary solution phi is actually a Gaussian process in space with finite one value, or whose covariance has finite one variation. So by the previous theorem of this and the try, it can be lifted to any higher levels, almost surely, to see p variation of path. And he proved that these sample paths are further continuous. And with the previous result of with the action rider, and we can actually derive the whole exponent of these things. So usually you view uh, one way is that you can view the solution as an evolution in function space. So that for any time t, it's a the the solution in X is in some function space and it, and, it, and it evolves with time t. So usually the larger the function space is, the lower the spatial regularity you get. But, you sh but the smaller the function space is, the higher regularity you can get. So here we say 
if you take p to be large enough, then the function space is the p variation is actually becomes smaller and smaller, then you can get higher and higher holding regularity. So what we do with our previous results, we can show that we can show about this relation and and phi t as our path can be arbitrarily close to one quarter holder in C P variation as long as you take P to be large enough. So this so here we view for fixed t, phi t is a rough path in space and we compare with phi s and phi t as two different rough paths and when s and t are close, it's almost one one quarter holder as long as P is large enough. And Okay, I think I stopped here and thank you very much.